Hi, I'm Bart Massey. Today I want to talk to you a little bit about what it takes to get uh, a little bit of embedded code running in Rust on the Cypede Longan Nano. We're going to build a little demo that does that. And uh, so I want to start by pointing out that the Cypede Longan Nano is a little RISC-V development board. It's got a 32-bit core with 128K of flash and 32K of RAM running about 100 megahertz. And one of the cool features is that on top of it, it has a little 160 by 80 um, one inch display, uh, which is kind of a fun little toy. So that's the, that's the hardware we're gonna be working with today. And I really wanna walk, walk through the whole process of getting set up to build for it in Rust. Uh, here's my actual running Longan Nano. I've put it in the case that comes with it. Um, you can see the companion video on my site to talk a little bit about unboxing and running the thing. Um, but you can see that it's got a little screen, it's got a couple of buttons. It's not a very interesting device to look at, but it should be fun. So the demo we're going to do today is a bouncing ball demo, because I'm doing a lot of bouncing ball demos lately. Let's start by looking at what's here in my little build director I've already set up, because it would take, I don't know, 45 minutes to do this. Um, now that I know how, and it would have taken a lot longer when I first started playing with it, but here's the deal with that. So, um, if you've never done embedded in Rust before, the first thing you have to understand is that you're cross-compiling. You're going to be building for a target platform, the RISC-V in this case, that's different than the um, source pro platform that you know, you're compiling on. Um, you definitely want to cross-compile. So how does that work? Let's start with that. Um, first of all, uh, yeah, anyway. So if you look at my cargo.2ml, there's nothing, Tommel, there's nothing very interesting in that Tommel file. I've got my little app set up and ready to build. Um, you'll notice that the dependencies are a little odd. There's the GD32 VF103XX HAL crate. That's the hardware abstraction layer. It provides, uh, sort of convenient rustic access to machine registers and uh, device registers and that kind of stuff. And so it's kind of a nice thing to have, but it's very, very low level. It doesn't provide much except a way to access all that stuff from reasonably safe code. And the RISC-V runtime crate, which um, has some stuff that this is going to use, the panic halt crate, which just provides a panic mechanism. We'll see that in a bit. The embedded graphics crate, which is going to let us be part of the solution for letting us draw on that cute little screen. And then there's Longan Nano, which we're going to enable the screen feature on that. So I broke out the dependency that way. Longan Nano is what's called the board support crate for this. Um, you can go look at the documentation for that. It's very common for commonly available boards to have somebody throw together a board support crate that consolidates a whole bunch of low, low, other low level stuff and adds some glue. So there's code in this board support crate to talk to the display, help set up and talk to the display. There's code in this crate to uh, deal with the RGB LED that's on that board and be able to access and deal with it. Um, there's some other stuff provided. The crate's still at an early stage, but there's some other thing conveniences that it provides. Um, so I've been really grateful to have that. That makes things go easier and faster. So there's no clue here that we're going to be cross-compiling, but we are. Let's look at .cargo slash config, which is a thing you don't normally need to have. But in this case, it says, well, we're going to build this thing for the target RISC-V32 iMac unknown nun elf. So if you haven't yet, this is a good time to say rust up target. Um, add risk 532 imac unknown none elf and when you've done that then you'll be in position to after it finishes that you'll be able to deal with that target and then you'll notice up here in the top there's a couple things you don't care about that this just defines what you're going to do when you're building for this target um one is you provide a runner so that you can actually JTAG debug with GDB. And we won't worry about that today. Uh, the other thing that you need to provide is a uh, 
couple args to the link thing. One, uh, link.x is actually part of the board support crate and is not something you need to worry about. The other one, memory cb.x, it turns out there's two versions of the Longan Nano board. One is the C8 version, which has uh, 24K of RAM and less flash. And then there's the CB version, which is what I have and what you really want, which has 128 flash and 32 of RAM. And uh, so for anyway, for that, you're going to want this memory map here. Um, and you'll notice that, you know, this just describes where the flash starts in the address space, where the RAM starts in the address space, and how much of each there are. It also explains which things are should be, when compiling, should be in the flash, and which things should be in the RAM. So that's pretty straightforward. Um, there's a build.rs whose sole purpose is to set all that up. Um, this is a solution chosen by the board support people. It's maybe not the way I would do it, but it works. Um, and uh, so that just copies that down that memory script down into the build directory where it can actually do it. You'll notice I've commented out the C8 stuff because I didn't have the C8 script handy. Whatever works. So there's that. Um, what else is in here? The process for building a thing is that we're going to compile the source. And that'll give us down in the target directory um, a ELF file in a full of RISC V instructions, which is the thing that we actually want to load up. But we can't load it in that form. We're going to use an upload utility called DFU, Direct Firmware Upload, for that. Um, in fact, the stock, and that'll let us upload directly through the USB C port on the Nano through a bootloader that's on there. Um, it turns out the Debian stock DFU util doesn't actually work, so you want to get the one from Cyped. This README has a link to um, Seed Studio's thing where you can download their board util tools. You want their um, DFU util, and you want their um, binary maker. So let's look at mukbin.sh. So once you've compiled successfully, you run this script I wrote, this mukbin.sh script. What does that do? Well, the core of it, it does an obj copy. That is, it copies that elf binary out of the target directory and converts it to a different binary format that the uploader wants, and it sticks it in a .bin file here. So then, once you've done that, then we run dfu util to actually load that thing up to the nano, and off we go. So that's that. Uh, there's also some OpenOCD JTAG stuff here. I don't think I'm going to talk about that today. That seems like a future thing. I don't think I should need it for anything we're going to do today. Note that without that, though, without a JTAG adapter hooked up and without JTAG support on your um, OpenOCD and GDB setup for JTAG, you're not going to be able to debug on the board. Um, and what we'll see as we start to look at the actual source is that when this thing crashes, um, so we're running Nostud. Nostud is an interesting thing. It means that the standard library of Rust, which contains a bunch of things that you're used to using, is not available. Vex are not there, for example. It goes that far down. And panicking is not there, because the standard library really is the thing that provides all the panic support and panic handling support. And why? Well, because the standard library is huge and wouldn't fit in the flash on this tiny device anyway. And there's not enough RAM in any case to provide all the heat that the standard library would like to have to operate. And so instead, we just don't use it. And that makes things a lot harder. Um, you'll notice we're also no main. We'll talk about that in a bit. But what I was going to say here is that the panic halt crate actually loads some macros and stuff. When this thing panics when your rust program panics it's just going to hang in an infinite loop somewhere in the machine you're going to get no real good indication that the panic even happened the way we have things set up right now so don't panic um, be really careful not to do that we use a bunch of stuff this is mostly boilerplate code that was taken from the board support packages examples um i don't use i don't i haven't paid real close attention to it to be honest it all seems to work 
Um, here's the code for the thing we're going to write. And you'll notice that when we're done, when our program is done running, there again, there's no place to exit. Um, so it isn't like we're on a multitasking operating system. There's no point in exiting anyway. So we just jump into an infinite loop and finish main. And that's a pretty common theme. What we'll see later on in this demo as we hack it up, we'll hack it up to run forever in an infinite loop. But the point is there's no place for main to return to. So let's look a little bit at what it is we're trying to build. Um, what I want to do is bounce a little four by four square of white pixels, a little ball around it, that screen in much the way you would see on an old VCR, just a little bouncing ball, screen savory thing. And to do that, I'm going to start by doing, again, this is boilerplate from the board access crate. I'm going to get the, um, use the peripheral access crate to get a handle to all the device registers used for the peripherals. I'm going to split out the um, resource control unit thing and um, get out the clocks and set up the clocks. So you'll notice that the external clock is a high frequency 8 megahertz clock. Um, well, high frequency. It's an 8 megahertz clock that's you know off a of crystal and that's being divided to run a 108 megahertz uh, 108 megahertz uh, internal clock and then I'm going to get the a handle to the GPIO bits by splitting those off and you notice this is all pretty rustic we've got you know pretty safe clean implement interfaces this is part of why we like programming in rust and then the reason I needed those GPIOs is some of them are connected to a spy port a serial port that connects the processor to that little LCD display the display itself actually has a display controller on board and it has the LCD display. Um, and you communicate with that display controller that's on the display itself with a serial port from the RISC-V part. And so we get those pins, we set that all up. And then um, because the board support crate has an issue right now that I haven't had time to track down completely and fix, I'm just gonna hardwire the display size to 160 by 80. That's not ideal, but it's where we have to be. Um, the ball width and height are gonna be four by four. And having done that, I'm gonna clear the display, which calls this draw rec thing, which is something I wrote. How does that work? Well, um, let's talk a little bit about this funky display. This is a um, display driven by a controller. So you actually send commands up to the display, display controller to do things like um, fill regions. So the embedded graphics crate, which is what's doing the draw command here, actually ends up through a complicated process sending serial commands up to the display controller to make it do what you want. And in this case, what I want, it turns out, is to draw a new rectangle with an upper left hand, uh, you know, X and Y column and row, um, and a lower right, um, coordinate and I'm going to draw the rectangle and I'm also going to fill it with some color where that color is into RGB 565 so it turns out this display is configured in such a way and this is arguably the right thing to do that it's a 16 bit per pixel display and five bits of that 16 are red six are green and five are blue and so types there's several types that you can convert into an rgb 565 pixel and um, we'll take any of them here so let's go back down to so we call this and it should draw on the screen it should be that simple um what we're first going to do is clear the screen so we're going to make it draw a rectangle as big as the screen and make it uh fill it with zero fill it with all the pixels black so we've blacked out the screen now and now just as a demo, we're gonna draw a white square at the center, the ball at the center. And that ball is gonna be as simple as go to, you know, the center of the screen um, for the left top coordinate and then um, draw another rectangle. And this one's gonna be all 16 bits turned on. So this will be 565 white. And uh, there we are, we've got a draw -y thing. So having written our little embedded program, let's actually build it. Um, I'm gonna, uh, let's do it this way, source 
slash main.rs so that we don't wait a while. It has to build, obviously, a lot of the board support quotes and stuff. Normally, um, when you're building this stuff, you will build it release because you want it to be small. You aren't so much concerned about performance, maybe, but you've only got 128K of flash, you've only got 32K of RAM. Uh, the exception, of course, is if you're going to use JTAG and debug the thing, then you need to build it for debugging. You've got to watch out a little bit in that case that you haven't built your thing to be too big to debug, um, which is a really annoying problem. So in this case, it compiles it, and you'll find in target slash uh, risk five blah slash release slash nano ball, you'll find uh, this. And what is this thing? Well, it's an elf file in risk five of full of risk five instructions. And that's what you wanted to have. And so then I'll run this, um, uh, run this. Um, and you'll notice that it mostly just processes a bunch of flags. And when it's done that, it calls this obj copy to take that nano ball thing and make a nano ball dot bin. And now I'm going to reset my um, computer here. And the way you do that is one of these buttons is reset. Let's see, I can always remember. The, this, this button on the top is reset and this bottom on the thing is boot. So you hold down reset, then hold down boot, then let go of boot, then let go reset, and then let go of boot. Oops, maybe it's the other way around. I don't know. Apparently so. Hold down boot. Uh-huh. All right, well, I've done this before. I'm just... All right, I'm going to power this off, power it back on and try it again. This whole thing's a bit fiddly, and I've had adventures like this before. Let's see which is which here. That get it? Maybe. So the other thing is you can't always tell because the display is sometimes just persistent. Let's assume we got it going here, and let's try to upload it. Um... Nope. Okay. We'll try one more time to reset it. And it must be the other way around. Maybe that got it. There we go. And now having reset it successfully, which gives you no visible indication that it's done so, you're in a position where you have now uploaded your thing. And now, um, when I reset it next, I actually end up usually having to power it off and back on. And hey presto, there's my little thing. You can see it with the one little pixel square in the middle there, which is just what I wanted it to be. So that's pretty sweet. So the next step is going to be to make the thing bounce and that is just pretty much straightforward rust programming the good news is that the hard part is out of the way we've done all the wacky embedimation stuff um that's all done now we don't have to worry about it anymore all we have to worry about now is writing some software so let's do that um and what we're going to do here is um just put the ball where it wants to go uh, so we're going to move this loop on the outside and it's going to do that and then we'll go escape for control X greater than and then we'll be a little embarrassed by this whole mess and we'll fix this to look more like this. Uh huh. And now, um, What I really think I want to do here is move, having done that is undo it all. How embarrassing. Um, left equal this and top equals this. 
and we'll start them at the middle. That's as good a place as any to start them. And we'll make them mutable because we're going to drive the ball around. Um, and so let's write the obvious thing here. Um, we're going to uh, mute dx equals one. Let mute dy equals one. Um, you know what? Let's just start these at zero. I don't really care. I don't need my fancy nonsense. So now we've got a direction the ball's moving in, and um, we've got a position that the ball is at. And now we just need to do the physics equations. We say, well, um, left plus equals dx, top plus equals um, dy. And unfortunately, the thing that we forgot to do at this point is a couple things. First of all, we need to clear the old position because we want to erase the ball that was there before. We're going to get trails. So let's go 0u16 here. And um, uh, That actually is right. Now we're going to increment um, erase ball. And now we're going to increment that. And that all looks great. But of course, we don't have any clipping at all. Um, if left plus ball with greater than or equal to width, um, left equals, no, dx equals minus dx. And the same thing for clipping on height. Um, notice the ball's square, so I didn't really need separate width and height coordinates, but eh makes it easier to read this way. So we'll do some sinful copy paste programming. And now it looks like we do the same thing. We draw the new ball and we want to draw that ball basically with the same drawing call. Now the only trick here of course is that the way this stands right now there's no delay. It just tears through there. Um, update ball position and um, so what I need to do at some point in here is I need to sleep so I need to figure out how to sleep let me try to remember how to do that um, and we'll just dig an example out of the board support crate. By the way, the long end nano board support crate is full of fantastic examples. Um, and one of the classic first examples is to make the LED blank around. Oh, here we go. So I need this. Um, I need to be able to, in the main program, grab a delay operator where do i get m cycle delay i get it from the how um do i need gpiox i don't because i'm not going to be using the um gpios at all and it looks like i also need this out of the embedded HAL crate. That means I probably need the embedded HAL crate. Did I include that already? Let's find out. I 
I see no embedded help right here. So let's look at our Blinky example again. And ask where embedded how comes from. There we go. Okay. We will use the embedded how crate. And um, throw that in there. And we'll just use whatever version they gave us on the theory that's probably going to be all right. All right, now let's look at how it actually does this. It does it with delay dot delay MS 500, which I think we're gonna go a little faster than that. We're gonna start with 100 milliseconds, um, but that's the idea here. It is right here somewhere. Uh, We'll draw the ball, and then right here, I guess, we will delay um, delay to show ball, and so we'll make that delay, like I say, smaller. Let's let's make it a hundred milliseconds, and we'll see how fast that looks. Now, this is the part where Rust embedded development looks cool. With the C program. If I compile this, that's fantastic, and then it won't work, and then I'll spend a long time debugging it. Here, I'm pretty confident that if I compile this, it will actually run the first time, which is a pretty cool thing to be confident of. If it isn't, I'm pretty confident that I'll be able to stare at it and figure out what's going on without having to get out a debugger. If we have to, we can get out a debugger. I'm set up to do that, but let's hope we don't. So let's try just building it first and see what happens. Right. And have to grab the uh, embedded HAL crate, I imagine. Right, so it's going to check all these crates. Um, I don't know why I did cargo check here. I guess I was just curious to see if it would work partly. Um, but that means it's going to build for debugging. It says everything's cool. Okay, that's good. And let's build it says sure you've got yourself a working nano ball compiled on the first try that happens a lot okay let's see what happens um let's just forget the minus x at this point we know what it does all right let's reset our little device here however you do that darn it All right, that's one of those should have got me there. Let's see what happens. <sighs> nope. All right, so it really is. Reset is on the bottom, boots on the top. Hold down boot, toggle reset, and it should work. Yep, okay. So reset's on the bottom of the thing and as you hold the USB connector on the right and uh, boots on the top and so you hold down reset you hold down boot you, you hold down and let go of reset and you let go of boot that's how you do it and when you've done that then we're up and running I'm gonna repower it to see what it does whoa first try people it is now moving the ball off the screen. It's incredibly slow, so that's too bad. Um, the bounce is gonna be slowish. And the other problem with it, of course, is that um, we landed in the corner and the clipping's not quite right somehow, and so now the ball has disappeared forever and eventually bad things are gonna happen. But we have a good start. We are in a very, very good place. So let's fix this one more time and we should be done with this project. This is about as fast as embedded stuff goes together. All right, so we're gonna speed that up by a factor of, I don't know, four? Yeah, let's make it 20 milliseconds. Um, that looks about right. And let's see what we screwed up here. No, that 
looks right. That looks right. If we hit in a corner, it should flip around the other way. Oh, maybe it gets trapped once it goes past an edge, but still that should be all right. Um, let's, Let's have the bounce take finite time here. This is all about um, um, and what I'm going to do here is say left equals width minus all width, and here I'm going to say um. And I'm going to be careful with the minus ones here because things get a little weird. Uh, maybe that's it. Maybe I was just off by one. No, I had greater than or equal. That's weird. I don't know. And then we'll say. Oh, I don't bounce at zero, do I? Oh, yeah. Right, so that's probably the real bug, actually. Okay, so I'm being a little overcautious here. Um, height minus ball, height minus one. Okay, and now I've got that all set up, and that's great, but um, that isn't what I actually want to do. So I'm going to put this back the way I found it, and then fix the actual bug. And see, this is the problem with not having a debugging environment is that, you know, I could have conceivably jumped into the debugger there instead of having to just figure out what's going on. Um, but, you know, here we are. Uh, left is less than or equal to zero or this. And top is less than or equal to zero or this thing. And now we should be in a better place. So we fixed that bug. We fixed the bouncy bug. The other thing we wanted to do is speed it up. We sped up that. Um, let's move that delay to a beautiful constant at the top of the file. Const. Oh, it's better to the type, so I'm not going to try to figure it out. I'm not going to do manual type inference. Oh, why not? Um, frame time. I don't know. I have no idea what it is. Um, equals 20 milliseconds. Uh, and then we'll use frame time here. And then we'll build. And then it will fail because it wanted you anything but you size, basically. <laughs> I guess I'll use um, delay MS. It can be I32, U16, U32. Okay, so U32 here looks like it'll be fine. I just don't care. There we go. All right, one more try. Let's see if we can reset it on the first shot this time. Whoops. There we go. And uh, so I'm going to actually fix dfu load.sh to call nah. I was going to say I could have a one shop stop shopping center here. Anyway, let's make it Let's um, upload it. Hey, it's running up there. Now we should be bouncing five times faster, and we'll go grab our little hardware bits here, which are having some issues because the 
display. One of the tricks with this case is to get the display to actually line up properly with the case, and so far we have failed, um, which means that the case doesn't fit together very well. But anyway, um, let's reset this one more time. Heck, let's just power off and back on. That seems to be the secret formula. Oh! Now it's stuck in the upper left-hand corner. Why is it stuck in the upper left-hand corner? Okay, we took our beautiful working thing and broke the stuffings out of it. Let's look at it one more time. Um... What did I do? What do I start this thing at? Oh, zero. So it just gets immediately stuck in the corner. Um, yeah. Let's go one. It's the little stuff that gets you. Yeah, tried to turn it around because it bounced it there in the corner, and that's not going to work. So we'll just move it a little over, and that'll be fine. McBin. DFU load, reset my world again, darn it, okay, there we are, and still stuck in the corner. Makes no sense. I'm gonna re. I don't. I don't think it is. I think I just need to repower it. Hey, look at this. She bounces. She bounces just like she was intended to. And because the ball's a little wider than zero, um, over time that bounce is gonna get more and more different. Remember, the display is um, 60 by uh, 160 by 80, and so it would have been a really boring. Um, pattern if the ball didn't have finite width but the ball does and here it is bouncing and it will bounce forever and that is embedded debug embedded programming in rust on the long end nano i will leave some links to things uh so that you can find this code uh it's actually at um my PDXCS Rust repository called Nanoball, and I will commit the changes we've made and push it on up. And I want to thank, in particular, I always forget to acknowledge people. This time I definitely want to acknowledge the authors of the uh, Long End Nano Board Support Crate, uh, Cypede and Seed for making the Long End Nano a thing. Um, and the author of an article that's linked in the README, which is an article about programming the Nano and Rust, which got me interested in this chip. So, and also Keith Packard, who helped me with JTAG debugging and some other things. So thanks, thanks for watching. Really, really appreciate it.